In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The fourth chapter, and uh, let's read, or let's look at two verses out of a story that is well known to all of us. And uh, the two verses are the 11th and 12th verses. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And out of the eleventh verse, the woman saith unto him, You don't have anything to draw with. You don't have anything to draw with. And the well is deep. Let's pray. Praise God. We thank you tonight for this great occasion that we have assembled together. And we ask you now to direct us in our thinking, in the move of the Spirit, And, O God, we lean heavy upon you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Now, I am old enough to remember back in my childhood days in the area that I lived, it was not uncommon for people to get their water out of a well. Most of the uh, yards, especially in the country areas, had uh, wells out of which to draw their water. I think our children today miss so much, and yet I'm not crying to go back to those days, but Wells have always fascinated me. I just, those wide mouth wells that you could lean over the uh, railing and look down into and when your eyes got accustomed to the darkness, you could see the water shimmering and you knew that if you dropped a bucket that uh, you could uh, pull up a fresh amount of cool water, the best tasting water that you could get from anywhere. Of course, now it wouldn't be that way. We've got so much contamination and pollutants, but there was just something about a well that that I was really fascinated by. To drop a bucket or to drop something in there and pull up some fresh, sparkling water that tasted oh so good. But we're beyond the age of the uh, open wells. Ours today is the space age. Yeah. Some have gone to the moon. And our vocabulary has been enlarged to include uh, such terms as spaceships and astronauts and lunar buggies and shuttles and Blast off, and countdown, and challengers. Yeah. And then we're also in the uh, computer age. Programs and programmers and floppy disks and hard disks, silicone chips, bytes and megabytes. 
Some of them you can't even find in the dictionary. They're so new. We're in the electronic age. And that includes radar, television, satellites, and so many things that would come under the electronic age. I was in Bangkok, Thailand a year or so ago, and I needed to make a phone call back to the States. And in my hotel room, there was a little card that identified the fact that they had international subscriber dialing. And the instructions were on that little card to dial... 001, that was the access code. Then it told you to dial the country code number. And then you dial the area code and the city number. Then you dial the number of the party that you were going to call. And the sign or the little card said... If a connection tone is not heard approximately 30 seconds after dialing, hang up and redial. 30 seconds. So you would dial 0001131483773300 and in 30 seconds you would have a connection. If you didn't, hang up and redial it. And out of the millions of phones in America, you could way over in Bangkok single out one specific phone by dialing a certain set of numbers. That's to me amazing. We humans have fathomed into the depths of the earth and we've learned its secrets. We've explored the heavens. We know the distances of the stars in light years. We know to get to the Andromeda galaxy, you'll have to travel one and a half million years at 11 million miles a minute. But you're not here tonight in this designed service for me to tell you all about these things. But I've told you that to tell you this. Jesus sat at that well. That fascinates me. Well, it's fascinating. Give me a drink, he said to the woman. How is it that you a Jew asketh drink of me? And he said, If thou knewest who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Now, can you imagine a woman of the world, five husbands, the one she was now living with was not her husband, telling the Creator, that he didn't have anything to draw with? Yeah. And Jacob's well was deep. If you've been there and you've seen the well, they say it's over a hundred feet deep and if you take a little pebble and drop it, you can count to ten before it strikes the water. It's that deep. So it is a deep well. But for a loose woman, a woman who has experienced so much sin and so much worldliness, to tell Jesus, God in Christ, that he didn't have anything to draw with? No. And the world who is represented by this woman... With its space age, its computer age, its electronic age, and its immorality, and its evolution's ideas, 
those God rejectors and all you want to call them are like the woman at the well saying to the church, hey, you don't have anything to draw with. And the well is deep. Ha! Ah, praise God. I don't know much about computers. I've never been to the moon. And I don't know a lot about electronics. But I know they're wrong. Amen. The well's deep, all right. They're right there. It is deep. It's deep. But we do have something to draw with. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You see, the world comes to the depths and they approach it from reasoning. They got to reason it out. And reason stands at the edge of a deep well, baffled, looks into its depth, and does away with it in their reasoning. Reason won't get you there. I'm talking about not just a well, but the deep things of God. And there seems to be in this meeting what Psalms 42 and 7 said, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spouts. And then again in Psalms 107.24, These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Habakkuk 3 and 10 says, The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. And then Paul said in Romans, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Ah. Hey, folks, I think we've already got the bucket starting to lower. Amen. The world says you don't have anything to draw with. We may not be as smart as they are. You know, reason started away back in the book of Genesis. When Cain, and I believe he was sincere probably when he wanted to worship, but he reasoned that to worship you must do it in a beautiful manner. So there's nothing more beautiful than a basket of fruit. And so he reasoned that to worship, he would get together the colorful fruit that he had had something to do with in raising. And he brought his beautiful fruit basket. But Revelation ignores the beauty and brings dripping blood. Hallelujah. Abel's worship was not out of reason. It was an act of revelation. Praise God. And if you're reasoning it out tonight, you're going to keep it uh, sedate and uh, ritualistic and formal, and cold, and the world will go along with you. Because that's their reasoning too. Amen. Make it beautiful. Do all of the doxologies and all of the icons and all of the things that, uh, that you can bring in to refresh your memory. And just don't depend on marvelous supernatural revelation. But, hey, it's not all beautiful in that sense. Revelation brings the dripping blood. Hallelujah. And their reasoning is doing away with dripping blood. Paul said, I have not seen. 
nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth, and here it is, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Hallelujah. The Spirit does that. The Spirit does it. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise God. Do away with your reasoning now. Amen. Open your mind to the revealed things of the Spirit. Let your fertile mind be endued with the power from on high. Forget about me. Forget about anything that I'm saying other than let's, let's get the Spirit flowing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because we're tired of the shallows. Amen. Amen. When you've had the best, you develop a taste. Hallelujah. And I've had the best. Not satisfied with a mediocre. Amen. Let's soar to the heights. Oh, let's skim the milky white ways. And I'm not talking about something that's far-fetched nor sensational. I'm saying to you that according to the Word of God, there's nothing more exciting. Praise God. The deep things of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo! Let's praise Him together. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. I want you to see something with me. They tell me, and I'm not all of that uh, much of an authority on it, but before every earthquake or before every volcano erupts, all the birds and the animals sense impending danger and they flee. I don't know just how true that is, but I've read it. That before the earth gives its first tremor and the first flow of lava belches out over that volcano ledge, that they sense it and they flee. Now, that's something, isn't it, for him to give birds and animals that kind of a, a sense. But he doesn't just do it for them. Even before Pentecost, the wise men were warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod. And they went home a different way. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I believe that every one of us in this building tonight has the sensibility and the innate ability to sense impending danger and to sense sin and an ability to feel it when it is near. Amen. Praise God. Unless you have uh, immuned yourself and uh, numbed yourself, a warning light flashes and tells you to keep your distance to certain people and to certain situations, you can almost smell evil. Long before the radar, you had one. You can feel it about books and pictures, amusements. Amen. God forbid that we should ever reach the place. Now, I'm not against guidelines and things, but that we as an individual should ever reach the place that we cannot feel. Hey, it's wrong. That is wrong. Amen. The Spirit says that's not for you. You will proceed at your own risk. And many do. 
And they fall by the wayside. You may not be able to explain it. How can you explain it? But something on the inside says, Danger! Keep away! Don't do that! Don't go there! I'm talking about deep things now. These are not profound statements, but I'm talking about deep things that you ought to be able in your living for God to sense that it's wrong. Amen. Your brain is not the wisest part of you. And you are not saved by your cleverness. The world... By wisdom, knew not God. And so they come to us and say, hey, that well's deep. You don't have anything to draw with. They just don't know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The church should be the most exciting, vibrant, victorious institution, if I could use that word, and I don't use it like it sounds, but it should be the most victorious institution in the world today. And if it isn't, it's an indictment against every one of us, from the minister to every church member. Amen. If the church is not the most exciting, most vibrant, and most victorious institution, there's an indictment against us. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. The lightning speed with which this tormented, deceived generation is plunging toward eternity should compel every child of God to cry out, Where is the power of Pentecost and the profundity of its gospel witness? Somewhere. Far away from the narrow prison, far from the dark, damp tunnels of our mental fixation, beckon the fresh, sweet paths of spiritual insight leading to vast treasures of power and success. Hallelujah. God would not predestine, and I believe in predestination as far as the church is concerned, but He would not predestine a church without providing the means whereby it could become the most powerful force in the world. Praise God! He wouldn't do it! Amen! Jesus told His disciples near the end of His earthly ministry, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. And just prior to His ascension, He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Power. Praise God. Praise God. The gifts could not be given. And incidentally, the gifts of the Spirit are, are a part of the bucket and the rope that drops down into the depths. Amen. We do have something to draw with. And the gifts could not be given until He ascended because the power we have is not of ourselves; It is from on high. And Paul said, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave Gifts unto men. Praise God. Woo! Praise God. Hey, we're standing on the edge of a deep well. And there's water down there. Praise God. And the world says you don't have anything to draw with. We, we're, we're going to show them. Amen. Praise God. He made our possibilities unlimited by limiting Himself. There is a world of spiritual power available to us today. Amen. He took the flesh, His flesh, out of the way so that the Spirit could work. And the secret of our power is not in any ability that we possess, but to the degree the Spirit possesses us. You say, well, I've got the Holy Ghost, but does it really possess you? Are you in Pentecost or is Pentecost in you? Praise God. Praise God. 
Amen. The unfathomable resources of heaven await our command and come into effect to support our claims and back up the gospel that we preach. It is staggering to think that Jesus would have us to do greater works than He did. The book of Acts is our evidence of the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy and promise. Jesus breathed upon the disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, they didn't receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost at that time, but it was a promise. But after the day of Pentecost experience, it was common for the apostles to lay hands on the seekers and for them to receive the Holy Ghost at that very moment. Although Jesus never laid hands on anyone to receive the Holy Ghost, He allowed this extended power to the apostles. Greater works than these shall He do. Praise God. Jesus never anointed handkerchiefs or aprons and sent them out to the sick. But check the record. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from His body, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Greater works. Read of the power through the Apostle Peter in Acts 5, 14 to 16. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude, and they were healed, every one. Some were healed as the shadow of Peter passed over them. Now, Jesus never did this, but He set no pattern, but just simply said, greater works. Hallelujah. The early church members spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance, both in other tongues when they received the Holy Ghost, and they were still under the anointing as they went from house to house. The early church did spiritual works with a wider scope than they had imagined could be possible. Stephen, one of the seven chosen to take care of the business of the church, was The Scripture said, full of faith and power, and he did great wonders and miracles among the people. The Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia could not resist his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Yet Stephen was simply a lay member, full of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now look at this. These early believers were so sensitive to the Holy Ghost that they would leave a great revival and go into a desert place without asking why. Because they knew that the supernatural power would be just as exciting with one man in a chariot needing guidance and salvation as it would be where great crowds would be gathered. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. The supernatural is exciting anywhere. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Woo. Hallelujah. Let's draw a little bit, will you? Amen. Amen! Amen! Praise God! The church is the multiplied body of Jesus Christ. He is not only one in one place, but in all of us everywhere doing more than He did in the flesh because there's so many more of us and we're in so many different places. The thrilling fact is Jesus promised that weak, insignificant humans can do great things through the Spirit. I defy the electronic engineers and the space career-minded people to say that we are ignorant and unlearned. Amen. That we don't know. Hey, we have more than reasoning. We have supernatural revelation. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I don't boast of a degree. I'm not uh, against them. But I'm telling you what, when 
You wake up in the middle of the night and he's talking to you and telling you things, amen, amen, that you can't learn anywhere else. I'm telling you what, that's exciting to me. Amen, amen. That's exciting to me. I still believe he does it. I still believe we need to be sensitive to it. I still think we've got to be open to it. Amen. He wants to talk to his church today. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus promised us power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This was not just an idle promise. Amen. That we would receive somewhere in the far distant future. This is now. This power is for us today. Right now. Amen. There is power within the Holy Ghost filled person that gives him ability and potency to do spiritual work by spiritual means. The principal thing God does for us is that which he does in us. He is limited now, not by His choice, but by our choice. We decide how much we will let Him work in us according to the power that worketh in us. Praise God. Are we, are we just at the, the hands of a despotic dictator that does things at a whim. And if we don't get in that category of his whims, that we don't get anything done for us. No, he says, according to the power that worketh in us. When a person is born again of the water and the Spirit, that person becomes a child of God. We are born of God. Amen. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Amen. And Second Peter 1 and 4 stresses that we are partakers of His divine nature. Praise God. We have a, a little bit of His nature. Now, we're not a God, but we are partakers of His divine nature. Praise God. The message of the whole of Scripture is that this miraculous, supernatural God should be manifest in His children. Therefore, as the children of the Lord, we are possessors of His very nature and ought to display evidence, not only of His perfect character, but of His mighty, divine faculties. Praise God. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, 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 amen. The spiritual gifts were designed to be the very heartbeat of the body of Christ. If we suggest or accept the concept that evangelism is the basic ministry of the church, then we must realize that we are not going to su succeed if we do not avail ourselves of the equipment that God has provided, the most effective manner of presenting the gospel is in power. Acts 4 and 33 records, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Hallelujah. Hey, we can't survive on programs. Programs are all right. Amen. And we can't survive on the abilities of man. Amen. Finance and physical aids, though necessary, will never suffice for the power of God. Never. Never, never, never. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Many years ago when I started out in the ministry, that's been a good many years ago, you know, uh, it's really a miracle that God called me to preach because I couldn't even testify. I came into the church when 
we had testimony services every night. And if you didn't testify, that meant that you had slipped. And so everybody testified. And I knew that I had to do it or they'd think I'd slipped. Amen. And so I memorized one, and I did it every time because I wasn't going to let them think I slipped. But it was a good one. The Lord hath done great things for me, whereof I'm glad. And I'd sit down. Oh, man. I was shy and timid and withdrawn and backward and, and uh, inferiority complex. You name it, I had it. God called me to preach. I had no options. If I was going to say anything at all, I had to really pray. Amen. I mean... Fast and pray and pray and fast. If I did anything and then did well to say, stay up there about five minutes. Amen. I didn't have any options. Just had to do it. But I've been preaching now over 40 years. I've got a few options tonight. I'd be mighty dumb if in the 40 years I didn't know how to do a little something uh, in my own self. But friend, I wish I didn't have those options. I wish I didn't have those options. I know by reason of use you get used to some things, but hey, I don't want those options. Amen. I still, I'd like to go back to that day, you know, when I knew, I knew that I just couldn't do it. You say, Brother Beckton, you mean you've reached a place? No, I don't mean that. But there's sometimes, you know, when you've got to be instant in season or out of season and, and you, you think, well, I can do it anyway. But, hey, I, I, do you remember when you were first asked to teach a Sunday school class? And you never had taught. And you didn't have any options either. Amen. And you studied all week long for that session. And when you got in front of those eight-year-olds... My, my, my. They might not have understood the thing you said, but they felt something. Don't you wish you didn't have any options today? You've got a lot of options nowadays. And friend, you remember when you were asked to sing that first solo? Yeah. You never had sung before an audience before and they asked you to sing. And you know, the, the usual statement always was this. Don't listen to my voice. Listen to the words. Hey, I wish we had more of that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you know, they started out singing after they got that said. Don't listen to my voice, but listen, please listen to the words. And they, they really meant it. And when they got that said and they got about halfway through the song and they broke and began to cry. You know, they didn't even get to finish the song, but oh, what it did. What it did. Now, they don't say it, but it, they act it. And I'm not referring to anybody, but they say in actions, don't listen to the words, but listen to my voice. Hey, we got a lot, a lot of options nowadays, but we will never be the effective. Now, that's the way the world goes at it. And they turn to us and say, the water is deep, the well is deep, you don't have anything to draw with. And when we do it on our own, we splash and spill and lose every bit of the water we draw up. But when we rely on the Spirit, hey, we don't need any options tonight. I'm not anything. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Power. Power. Paul wrote much about the gifts and how much and how they were to operate. And he admitted this in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Praise God. Praise God. 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In his opening remarks to the church at Corinth, immediately after his spiritual greeting to them, he said that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't want you to come behind in any gift. Praise God. Amen. It is of paramount importance that we remember that the church is a spiritual body. Praise God. We must be aware that the importance of the Spirit in its every activity can never be overemphasized. Once we yield completely to God, allowing Him to fill us with the Holy Ghost, we are faced with the necessity of allowing a continuing work of the Holy Spirit within us day in and day out. Praise God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. From the Amplified New Testament, 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 says, which is the first of several chapters dealing specifically with the nine spiritual gifts. Paul said, now about the spiritual gifts and in parentheses, the special endowments of supernatural energy. I like that from the Amplified. Now about the spiritual gifts, the special endowments of supernatural energy. The special endowments of supernatural energy. And that's exactly what the gifts are. Are, brethren, I don't want you to be misinformed. Hallelujah. I don't want you to be ignorant. Amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's praise Him again. Ah. Now, I fully believe that these nine gifts of the Spirit have been in operation in the church since the day of Pentecost. They were not named nor mentioned when one or several would be operating in a situation, but they did operate. And I believe you'll agree to that. It was not until Paul... And the church at Corinth seemed to have developed uh, some uh, situations that needed guidelines and understanding of how the Spirit works. For it must be forever understood that God is not the author of confusion. So though they weren't mentioned in Acts as gifts, so, in the church in Paul's time, they needed a clear understanding of these spiritual gifts. It certainly stands to reason that we today need to be knowledgeable of and about them. We need to be aware of misuse and abuse. But more than that, we should never let them fall into disuse. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Paul told the Corinthians, let all things be done unto edifying. As the church is edified, Christ is glorified. And when this very basic truth fully dawns on the individual members of the church and we begin to see ourselves as members of one body with Christ as the head, then the church will begin to function in the capacity that God intends for it to function. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. From the day of Pentecost onward, the church was and is the most exciting, the most exciting work in the world. You read in the book of Acts, there was a glory, a wonder, a miracle at every street corner. Amen. Yes, it was. Amen. And God has provided in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the resultant gifts of the Spirit, the means 
for the reproduction of his divine character and faculties in his church. Praise God. Let's take a look at some of these greater works that the apostles did through the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm not going to prolong too much tonight. I want you to see how the gifts operated in the lives of the disciples and how they operated in the early church. Let's begin with the three gifts of revelation and see how they work. Now, I'm, I know that some of this has been covered. The gifts of the word of wisdom and the gifts of the word of knowledge are very closely related. And although they do at times work independently of each other, they usually operate as a team. For when God reveals man's secrets by the supernatural, he will usually at that time provide supernatural wisdom as to what to do about it. Amen. One of the earliest incidents of this is recorded in Acts, the fifth chapter. Ananias and Sapphira were about to perpetrate one of the first accounts of hypocrisy upon the newly born church. And Ananias and Sapphira conspired between themselves to keep part of the money they had received from selling their land. And this was their right. They could have done that. But they did not have the right to make themselves look good by lying to Peter and pretending that they were giving their all. Peter could not have known about this deceit. But the gift of the word of knowledge began its supernatural work. Why? Had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land, Peter asked. Well, that was the gift of the word of knowledge, supernaturally revealed. What was going to be the punishment meted out by God against this dastardly deed? The word of wisdom moved in to let Peter know, and so he spoke it out to Sapphira when he said, Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Praise. Hallelujah. I've crossed some of your theological thinking, but hey, the gifts are supernatural. Paul, expressing supernaturally revealed knowledge, told the captain and the sailors on the ship that was to take him to Rome, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and sheep, ship, but also of our lives. That had to be a gift of the word of knowledge. Shortly afterward, when the storm drove the ship toward the rocks and all hope that they should be saved was abandoned, then the supernatural words of wisdom prompted Paul to say, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Hey, that's great wisdom, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> he couldn't have said it, though, if it hadn't been supernaturally imparted because it looked like they were going to still be lost. Amen. And I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall even be as it was told me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Backing up just a little bit, when, when a blinded Saul shuffled into Damascus, every follower of the Lord was so afraid of this zealot that he had persecuted them on every hand. And somehow, someone must get to him and tell him what he must do to find God. But all the Damascus believers were scared to death of him. Then it was the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of the word of wisdom that came into full operation as Ananias answered the call of the Lord and said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Even called his name, coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Notice the detailed facts and instructions were given to Ananias, not through a natural means. Nobody slipped him a note. Nobody knocked on his door. But the Spirit of God, through the most astounding supernatural method, told him what to do. I believe it happens today. It's got to happen today. It's got to happen today. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. And one day as Peter was praying on the housetop, God prepared him for his next great move. 
showed a, a vision to Peter that first, you know, kind of repelled him. But what was he to do about this unusual vision that he had just received from God? The sheep being let down from heaven. It didn't take long for him to find out because the Spirit always moves in time. And once again, the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of the word of wisdom work together supernaturally to let Peter know even the exact number of men at the door seeking him. The exact number. And he was instructed, Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And what was the result? A whole household of Gentiles. Praise God. We're saved. My, 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 my. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, what time did I start? Yes, my good friend, Brother Urshan likes a lot. He really means that. Uh, I tell you what, there's no more relaxing than being in a service. Amen. Praise God. Let's praise Him again. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I've talked about the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. The third gift of the revelation, the discerning of spirits. Not discernment, and not the gift of suspicion, but the discerning of spirits. And, and let me tell you something. The understanding and use of this gift is becoming more and more important with each passing day. Wrong spirits and false spirits are sometimes so hard to recognize. But this is no problem for the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. If two are in the bed, one taken and the other left, and two grinding at the meal, one taken and the other left, amen, he, he can tell. Amen. He knows. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Elamus had a lot of people fooled, but his veneer was peeled away as Paul set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Elam must fool most of the people all of the time, but he couldn't fool God for a minute. Paul, used by God with the gifts of the discerning of spirits, discerned the evil spirit in the woman at Philippi, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. Seducing spirits, lying spirits, are responsible for doctrines of devil and damnable heresy. If it were not for the gift of the discerning of spirits, these seducing, lying spirits could even deceive the children of God. Ooh, God, I need to exercise the gift of the discerning of spirits. I could be fooled, but God can never be fooled. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. The world is saying to us still, hey, you don't have anything to draw with. I think we're drawing something. <laughs> Praise God. I just dropped my bucket down in there again. Hallelujah. Holding it up. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. I may not know how to get to the moon, but one of these days I'm going to go way past the sun, moon, and the stars. Whew. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. The gift of faith. Yeah, we have to have all kinds of faith. But this is a supernatural gift of faith. Faith of the moment. Amen. Because this gift, like the others, is not a continuous operation. Faith arriving from the Word of God becomes a permanent part of our lives. We all have faith. The gift of faith is temporarily imparted for an express use 
And the New Testament is replete with examples of the gift of faith being manifested. And I would mention only one to you, and that's the working of faith in Peter when he said to the lame man at the gate, beautiful, and I believe that was a gift of faith. Now, he had faith, but Peter later explained why the lame man could go through the temple walking and leaping and praising God, and he said, in his name, through faith in his name. Now, I know we have faith in his name, but there was a supernatural something that came over Peter just at that moment when he saw that man there lying by the gate. And he explained it later, through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Praise God. And of the nine gifts of the Spirit, the working of miracles is the most sensational and dramatic. Amen. The act that can be achieved through human strength or ingenuity cannot be classified as a miracle. The young man who fell asleep while sitting in the window as Paul was preaching and plunged down into the streets below and was taken up dead to tell us a whole lot about miracles. <laughs> After Paul went down and through the gift of miracles restored into life. Praise God. Or you say, well, that was just his ministry. Well, what do you want to call it? Let it be our ministry. Whatever you want to call it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. It was something. Amen. Acts 5.16 tells more in a few words than I could describe with a whole lot concerning the gifts of healing. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. The gifts of healing and operation does much to turn people to God and to convince unbelievers of the truth of God's Word. It's also a means of inspiring faith and giving courage to God's people. Praise God. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot uh, tonight about the uh, gifts of inspiration. Uh, I, I sat this afternoon listening to all the questions and marvel that practically all the questions had to do with uh, these, these last gifts. There was, wasn't any questions about the gift of miracles, <laughs> but about tongues and interpretation and prophecy. And they're great gifts. Amen. I want to tell you something. I came into my office this summer after being away for a camp meeting. And I was only, it was Friday, and I was only going to be in the office for a few hours. And there was a note on my desk that said, Please call Gene Martin. And gave me the number to call. I didn't know what she had called about or why I should return her call. Please call Jean Martin. I called. Uh, the note said she had called several times that day. And I called and she answered. And she said, uh, Are you the uh, Brother Beckton that preached a camp meeting in uh, Oklahoma? Uh, some two or three years ago, and I said, well, I preached at Camp Meeting in Oklahoma. Well, she said, I want to talk to you. She said, I have been intending to call you for a long time. She said, I should have called you long before I had. I want to tell you something. She said, uh, my marriage was broken, and I had one little girl... 14 years of age, I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I didn't care about church nor anything that had to do with church. My mother lived in Oklahoma, and she was Pentecostal. And I sent my little 14-year-old girl to spend the summer with her because she had very little to do, said she was out of school and I was working. And she went to that camp meeting. And she said, in one of the night services, there was uh, a message of tongues and interpretation. And she said, the interpretation was somewhat on this wise. 
He said, I can't tell you verbatim. But it was in essence, there was one who needed God that was there in the service that night, the message went. And the message concluded by saying that they will not live to be in another camp. And she said, my little 14-year-old girl went to the altar that night and said to her, mo- her grandmother, that's me. But she didn't get anything that night, but she went home with my mother to the weekend services and she was baptized in the spirit with the baptism of the Holy Ghost at that weekend service. And she said to her grandmother, she said, I'm not going to live. And she said, uh, when she came home and told me about it, she said, I was, I was really upset. In fact, I was, I was mad that anything would happen in a Pentecostal camp that would upset my little 14 year old girl in such a manner. She said, I don't mind telling you I was upset because she was perfectly healthy, nothing wrong with her. And she was telling me all about her experience of getting the Holy Ghost. And she said, Mother, I'm not going to live. I want you to promise me that you'll meet me in heaven. She said, Oh, honey, don't talk about that. But she said, In one month, a degenerative nerve disease struck her body. And she lived eight months and died. And she said, before she died again, Mother, meet me in heaven. She said, now the reason why I'm calling you is that I went to a Pentecostal church in the Dallas area. I took my boyfriend, who was quite an executive businessman, and when he, he went with me, he said, this is not what I want, but if it's what you want, then we're parting ways. And she said, this is what I want. And she said, I just wanted you to know as a result of it all, I'm living for God. And I'm in the church. And she said, there's so many miracles that took place in the eight months that my little girl was was in the hospital with this degenerative nerve disease. So many miracles that the nurses, she said, I wish I could tell you everything. I don't have time. You don't have the time to hear it. But that hospital was so impressed with her life and her desire to live for God and to go to heaven that they are building a wing on that hospital and they are going to name it the Christy Martin Memorial Wing. I just got that call just a few weeks ago. And this mother said, I'm happy to tell you that I'm happy living for God. If it had not been for that night, amen. She said, I was mad, I was distressed, I was disturbed that anything would disturb my little girl. But something, somehow or another, God took advantage of an audience of three to 4,000 people, perhaps, I don't know how many, to talk to one little girl and say, get ready. Praise God. Amen. You say, I don't believe in the gifts. I believe in them. Amen. I was in service this past Sunday in Derrida, Louisiana, and the message of tongues went forth in the Sunday morning service and said, you're here, but you were so burdened that you could hardly get dressed to come. But you came, and I'm here to answer your need. And a lady came up afterwards and said, that was me. I could hardly pull myself out of bed. I've been so distressed about my sister who is not living for God, but said, God has touched me today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. I was preaching the Metro New York camp meeting uh, this summer. Uh, way up in a uh, beautiful part of New York, and there was a message one night that said there is a, a young individual here who just a few days ago you were driving in your car. You say, I don't believe in specifics. Well, hey, let me tell you what happened. 
Amen. You were driving in your car and you almost lost control of your car and you almost went over an embankment, but I stood there to keep your car from going over that embankment so that you could come and seek me this night. And a pastor came to me after a young man came running to the altar and said, that's the young man that God was speaking to. He had just told me that his car went out of control, but somehow or another it was set up right on the road. He couldn't explain it, but tonight he's in the altar seeking. In God. Oh, I tell you, folks, there is a move in the church, a move of power. Ah, ma, ma, ma. Oh, draw out of the world. Draw out of the world. Oh. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Rabba do korobosu shakarabasaya. What a set of power tools. My God, the great designer has fashioned them so that the work of the church can be accomplished easily and rapidly. The Lord is going to do a quick work in these last days. Sit down if you can. I want to tell you just a few more things. Oh, hallelujah. Just yield to the Spirit of God. I'm talking about revelation now, not reason. Amen. Get reason out of your mind. I don't want you, you, you to bring any beautiful fruit tonight. I love fruit, but hey, God wants dripping blood. Dripping blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, let's look at another, another well. We're looking down in it now. And the world says you don't have anything to draw with. Amen. Amen. You don't live in the world in which you appear to live. That's deep, isn't it? You live in a bigger world. The king of Syria sent a great host of horses and chariots and circled the city where Elisha was. And Elisha's servant rose early, went out and saw the city was circled. And he came with fear to Elisha. And Elisha didn't go and look and see. He fell down on his knees and said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. I say, you live in a bigger world. And the Lord opened his eyes and he saw a different world. Mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Hey, you think you're just sitting on that pew next to somebody and you're just in a small world. Hey, what if our eyes were opened up? To just see. <sighs> I stood on the platform in Palmyra, Columbia, South America some years ago when 5,000 people were worshiping with their hands over their heads and they were worshiping nonstop, nonstop, worship, 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 worship. And the missionary came over to me because I was peeking a little bit, amen, as I was worshiping. And the missionary said, Brother Becton, do you see what I'm seeing? And I'm so glad that I could say I did because out over the heads of those worshipers was a thin wisp of blue smoke. The Shekinah. The Shekinah. I don't see it tonight. Amen. Maybe I need to get my eyes open because I somehow feel that the Shekinah is here. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stephen was surrounded by an infuriated mob, but he wasn't even conscious of the mob. He was full of the Holy Ghost and he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Mm. Praise God. There was a reason why Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And again, when you become aware of the deep things, you scorn the shallow. An expanded mind can never 
be shrunk. I know too much. I lay on the front seat of a Pentecostal church as a three or four or five year old boy when the pastor would say, everybody that will help us sing, come on to the choir. Not a special choir, but everybody. And they knew they better get up there because if the power was going to fall anywhere, it was going to fall in the choir. Get up there. They didn't know what evangelistic style piano playing was back then. It was just four notes, plunk. Bass, tenor, alto, and soprano. Plonk. No introduction. Just the woman with the loudest voice led the singing, and she didn't even direct it. Praise God. We have to identify what a Christian is, what a Christian truly really is. Now, if I were to ask you, hey, brother or sister, what is a Christian, or what does the word Christian mean? I'm not going to ask you because I'm afraid you might tell me it means Christ-like. If you tell me the word Christian means Christ-like, all that simply means is you never looked it up. You didn't look in the dictionary or the lexicon. And my mama taught Susie, my sister and I, don't use words you haven't looked up because you might be using the word wrong. So the word Christian does not mean Christ-like. On page 672, column 1. Paragraph 3 of the Greek-English lexicon of New Testament words by Joseph Henry Thayer. He said the word Christian is from the Greek word Christianos, and it means follower and worshiper of Jesus Christ. A Christian is somebody who follows and worships Jesus, because in reality, we don't know nobody just like Jesus. Jesus Christ has never been duplicated and never been replicated. A follower and a worshiper of Jesus is a Christian. So the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You serve the God that you worship. I can hang out with anybody. That's why Evangelist Green, it was a treat to hang out with you. I can hang out with anybody 20 minutes. I will tell you who your God is because you serve the gods you worship. If you worship money, you serve your business or your job or whatever you do to get money. If you worship fashion, you serve clothes. If you worship education, you serve degrees. If you worship knowledge, you serve science. If you worship your body, you serve exercise. If you worship your belly, you serve food. If you worship lust, you serve sex. If you worship getting high, you serve alcohol. If you worship yourself, you serve pride. If you worship sin, you serve the devil. Let me admonish you. Worship God and serve Jesus. Jesus is the only legitimate object of worship in the entire world. Though our sins are scarlet You've made us white as snow Though our sins are scarlet You've made us white as snow